Our text is Psalm 23, verse 6. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beloved, the 23rd Psalm ends as it began with unshakable confidence in the goodness of God. Everything that the shepherd has done for the sheep, and remember the shepherd is none other than Jehovah God himself, everything that the shepherd has done for the sheep, he has done in his goodness and mercy. He feeds and he waters his sheep in his goodness and mercy. He guides them in his goodness and mercy. He protects them in his goodness and mercy. He restores their soul in his goodness and mercy. He brings them even through the valley of the shadow of death and back out the other side in his goodness and mercy. He gives to them liberally, generously, without ceasing in his goodness and mercy. And perhaps all of this in Psalm 23 seems too good to be true. There's always that nagging question in the back of our mind. Is this goodness and mercy going to last? Is it perhaps the case that the shepherd seeing the sheep and how miserable they are, how wayward they are, how foolish and quite frankly stupid they are, that the shepherd might finally get fed up with them and lose patience with them and be tempted in his exasperation against them to cast them out? Is there perhaps an end to the goodness and mercy? Will he say of his sheep, there's only so much sin and unfaithfulness that I can put up with and cast me off. Go and find another shepherd. I've tried my best. You're too wayward. You're too foolish. Enough is enough. You've tried my patience one time too many and I'm leaving you. You can wander in the wilderness by yourself. I'm off. Well, according to our text, and according to all of Scripture, that is impossible. There's mercy, and there's goodness for the sheep in the present. And the sheep have this assurance, and this confidence, that that mercy and that goodness will last forever. Because the shepherd is the faithful Jehovah God, and he will not and he cannot cast off even the weakest, most wayward, most foolish, most stupid, most stubborn of his sheep. And the sheep, to be truly happy, must know this. It's not enough for the sheep to know that today I am enjoying the goodness and mercy of the shepherd. I am lying down in his green pastures. Today I have the still waters. Today he leads me in the paths of righteousness, but perhaps tomorrow it might all end badly. No, the sheep must know that the shepherd will be faithful, and the sheep and here, here David is an example of one of those sheep. The sheep do know. They do know, and therefore they can confess in our text, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Wherever the sheep are going, the shepherd is leading them, but they're also being followed. They're being followed by the goodness of the shepherd. Notice then, pursued by the shepherd's goodness. This is the last of the verses concerning the happiness of Jehovah's sheep. They are pursued by the shepherd's goodness. First the meaning, then the assurance, and finally the end. 
When you read the Bible, beloved, it's good to look for striking words. And the striking word in verse 6 is follow. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. To follow is to come after, to come behind someone. But there's more to the word follow because this word follow is often translated in the Bible to pursue or to chase after or even to hunt for. Have you ever had an eerie, uncomfortable feeling that you are being followed? That someone or something is lurking behind you and following you? When you get that feeling, you're almost afraid to look behind you you naturally start to walk more quickly and you hope that soon you will be home. That's being chased or pursued in a negative sense. But here we have a pursuit, someone being followed in a positive sense. When the sheep who belong to Jehovah, as it were, look over their shoulder, they see something following them. And that something is the goodness and mercy of the shepherd. Goodness and mercy follow the flock. They follow the whole flock and they follow each individual sheep and lamb in that flock so that Jehovah's sheep need not feel uncomfortable or afraid or unnerved. When they look before them, they see the shepherd in his faithfulness, standing there with his rod and his staff. And when they look behind them, they see goodness and mercy following them. Think of that term, to pursue or to chase after. This is an earnest, a serious and eager pursuit. Sometimes when we are chasing after someone or something, we start following that thing or that person and we begin to lose heart. It's too difficult to keep running. We give up halfway. We lose interest. We turn aside. But that's not how the goodness and mercy of the shepherd follow us. Goodness and mercy follow after us persistently. You could say doggedly, always on our trail, hard on our heels, in hot pursuit of us. If I were to personify or use a figure for goodness and mercy, I could say of goodness and mercy that it is the shepherd, shepherd's faithful sheepdog or a bloodhound which never loses the scent, never gives up following. Also, this means that since goodness and mercy follow us or pursue after us, we can never escape them. You might be able to outrun someone who is pursuing you or to escape from them. But you cannot, says our text, you cannot outrun goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy will never be left behind. Sometimes, as verse 3 tells us, we need to be restored because we, in our foolishness, wander off the paths of righteousness and get ourselves into all kinds of difficulties. But, says verse 6, even then, goodness and mercy are following after us. Sometimes, as verse 4 tells us, we have to go into the valley of the shadow of death. And not only is the shepherd himself with us, not only do we have the assurance of the rod and the staff which comfort us, says verse 4, but goodness and mercy follow after us into that valley. We see therefore from verse 6 that the goodness and mercy of the shepherd are always behind us. And this is a great comfort to us. This is a great confession that the child of God can make. 
The shepherd's goodness and mercy never leave us. In fact, the shepherd is more keen to give us his goodness and his mercy than we are even to receive it. He is more keen to find us and to bless us than we are to be found and blessed. And that's the purpose of the shepherd. That's the goal of the shepherd in all things. To show us his goodness and mercy to the glory of his own name. For his own namesake, as it says in verse 3. Goodness. Good. Such a simple and commonplace word. In fact, if you used it in an essay, I just used the word good, I didn't use any synonyms, you might get marked down for a lack of originality in your writing style. And the word good is used so often, and without thinking, that we often use it so flippantly. And the wicked certainly use it very flippantly. But remember what Jesus said in Mark 10 verse 18. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. And so we should not be going around saying as the world does, Oh my goodness! As an as a alternative for saying God's name. Because goodness is God's goodness. In fact, there is no goodness except from God. And without God, the very term good is meaningless. If there's no God, and this is the answer to atheism, if there's no God, there's no such thing as good, nor is there such a thing as evil. There's just pitiless indifference in a vast, meaningless universe. Now this goodness in our text is the shepherd's, Jehovah's attitude and activity toward the sheep. If you could sum up in one word the attitude that the shepherd has toward his sheep, what one word would you use? Well, the Holy Spirit uses in verse 6 the word good. The shepherd is good to his sheep. And the shepherd is good, and Jehovah is good, and Jesus Christ is good, because the shepherd is morally and ethically excellent. In fact, you could sum up the whole being of God by saying, God is good. All of his ethical perfections come together, and he declares to us, I am good. In fact, the word God in English comes from the word good. And so in his care for his sheep, he is displaying all of his attributes, really, but specifically his goodness. And his goodness really is his benevolence, his desire to do good to his people. Now that word good is used often in the Bible. Sometimes it means beautiful, pleasant, pleasing, or agreeable. That's what God said of his creation when he had made it. Behold, it is good. Behold, it is very good. Good also means that it is fit for purpose, suitable, appropriate, or apt. And again, God looked at his creation and said, everything is perfectly fitted and ordered exactly as I had planned and designed it to glorify myself. Good also means something valuable, costly, expensive, of great price. For example, we speak of goodly pearls. And good also refers to riches, and abundance and wealth. And good refers in the Bible too to something that brings prosperity and happiness and peace 
and well-being, promoting our health or our welfare, that's good. Now all of those ideas, you can put them together, and when God says that he pursues us in his goodness, it refers to an attitude which says to us, I love you, I delight in you, you are beautiful to me, you are being molded in my sight perfectly as I have determined. You are infinitely valuable and precious in my sight. I am rich in blessing you. I hold nothing back when I bless you. I seek your blessedness, your ultimate happiness, your eternal welfare and your salvation in everything that I do. That's God's goodness to us. And this goodness it pursues after us. Think of the journey of a sheep. The sheep begins its day having slept in the sheepfold. And in the sheepfold, goodness has been there all night. Then the sheep are led out of the sheepfold into the green pastures, and goodness follows. Then we walk alongside the still waters, again pursued by goodness. We walk along the narrow paths of righteousness, and goodness is hot on our heels. We enter the valley of the shadow of death, and goodness has not given us the slip. We come to the shepherd's table, and into the shepherd's house, and goodness comes in with us and we've discovered as we look back that always every step of our way goodness has been following us even when the shepherd takes out his rod and his staff to chastise us even when the shepherd sends calamities into our life or takes from us those things we think we need to be happy everything the shepherd does is in his goodness to us because in everything the shepherd does the shepherd seeks our salvation but how how is it that the goodness of the shepherd can follow us if you have any spiritual sensitivity you should be asking that question how can the goodness of Jehovah God, the ethically perfect, holy, righteous God, how can that goodness follow after me when I am a sinner? I am a foolish, willfully wafer, disobedient sheep. How then can God pursue after me with this desire to bless me how can God follow me with his goodness not many people ask that question in fact most people in the world and even the church world ask a different question in fact they ask the opposite question the question we hear today is if God is good, how can God send suffering upon human beings? We had a speech about that. It was a, a good question and a good speech. But the question actually is very easy to answer. Because God is good, because God is morally perfect and holy, and because sinners are wicked and depraved, God must send suffering upon them. God's goodness demands that there be suffering for the wicked in this life, and everlasting hell after this life. The much more difficult question is, however, this. How can God, a good God, be favorably disposed towards sinners and bless them? How can he pursue sinners with his goodness? And closer to home, how can God be 
favorably inclined toward me, how can God bless me, and how can God love me? Have you ever asked that question about yourself? If you haven't, ask it now. Ask it, ponder it in your heart for a few moments. Think about it for a little moment. How is it possible that God should bless us, we who are sinners? And the answer is given in the text with the second thing that pursues us, mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There's a connection here between goodness and mercy. The two must come together. You cannot be pursued by the goodness of God unless at the same time you be pursued by the mercy of God. You could read the text this way. Goodness through mercy shall follow me, or goodness because of mercy shall follow me. In everything, God is good to us because of his mercy to us. God could not be good to us unless he first had mercy toward us. And the mercy of the text is that beautiful word in the Old Testament which refers to God's unfailing, steadfast, covenant love, which is often translated in the Old Testament kindness or loving kindness. It is compassion toward us in which he pities us in our lowly, needy, miserable state in the shame and bondage and guilt of our sin and by which he desires to make us blessed and actually makes us blessed. And this mercy is extended to miserable sinners in several ways. First, in his mercy, God elects his own sheep. That's the source. That's where it all begins. In the eternal decree of God to bless his people in mercy. Each of the sheep in Jehovah's flock, the ones who are being looked after by Jehovah and pursued by his mercy, whether they be older sheep or little lambs, each of them has been chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. It is not that they volunteered to be the sheep of Jehovah, but rather that Jehovah in his mercy set his love upon them before the world was. Second, Jehovah in his mercy redeems his sheep. Each of these sheep is a miserable sinner, guilty of so many sins, worthy therefore of terrible punishment in this life and in everlasting hell. But Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, went to the cross to pay for those sins, and each of those sheep, sheep and lambs, each of them was on the mind of the Good Shepherd when he laid down his life for his sheep. As he hung there on the cross, every one of his beloved people, known to him by name, was on his mind. He was thinking about them. He was saying, I am paying for the sins of all of my people. And in so doing, I purchase for them eternal life. I establish a righteous ground for God to show goodness to these ones. And only by the cross is it possible or even just for God to show goodness to us, to pursue us with goodness. And third, Jehovah mercifully takes us out of the devil's sheepfold in which we are by nature and gathers us unto himself by regenerating us 
and calling us out of darkness into his light. So we're chosen in mercy, we're redeemed in mercy, and we're gathered into his flock in mercy, made his own in mercy. And that is why it is impossible for God to bless the wicked, even to bless them in their earthly prosperity. God can give the wicked many things, money, health, all kinds of things, their heart's desire even. But with that, he does not bless them. And he does not pursue them with his mercy. He cannot. Because there is no mercy for the wicked. God did not elect the reprobate, obviously enough, because they are the reprobate. Christ did not die for them to purchase the goodness of God for them. And the Holy Spirit does not quicken them or make them alive, and therefore the goodness of God simply cannot follow after the wicked. It only follows after the sheep. The sheep in Jehovah's flock, according to verse 6, know without a shadow of a doubt that the shepherd is good to them and shall always be good to them. They are confident that whenever they look behind them, as it were, they will always see goodness and mercy pursuing after them. And that comes out in the very first word of our text. Surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And that word surely is a very little Hebrew word which is a particle of emphasis or assurance. A little Hebrew word which is very deep and rich in meaning. It means indeed, absolutely, assuredly, without doubt, truly, verily, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow after me. That David uses this word under the inspiration of the Spirit shows us that as Jehovah's sheep, as a representative of all of Jehovah's sheep, that he has no doubt, no hesitancy at all, in declaring that the goodness and mercy of Jehovah shall follow after him. There's no, maybe the goodness and mercy of God, or perhaps, or peradventure, or I hope so, but I know, I am confident, I have full assurance. And that little word gives glory to the shepherd. It glorifies the shepherd when the sheep are able to say, I know that the shepherd is good and merciful. But more than this, I know that the shepherd is good and merciful to me. To me. Goodness and mercy, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That's the language of faith. That's the language of full assurance of salvation. It's good to be able to say when you see the blessing of God upon your neighbor in the church, surely goodness and mercy are following him. Or look how God is blessing her in the church. But more precious it is to be able to say, but surely goodness and mercy they are following after me. I see them pursuing after me. I sense that they're coming behind me. I know that they're extended to me. But again we ask, what about the wicked? Do Jehovah's goodness and mercy surely follow the wicked? 
Do they? Do the mercy and goodness of Jehovah follow after the goats and the bears and the lions and the wolves and the enemies in verse 5 before whom a table is prepared? No. Well, what follows after the wicked then? Does anything follow after the wicked? Does God simply ignore the wicked? Is he indifferent toward the wicked? Is there a sheepdog following after the wicked? Well, perhaps there is a kind of dog following after the wicked, but that dog, if you want to call it a dog, is the curse of God. Proverbs 3.33 says this, The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. So the blessing of God follows after the righteous, God's beloved sheep, and the curse of God follows after the wicked. The wicked came into the world under the curse of God. In fact, the wicked were cursed by God in eternity in the decree of reprobation. That curse, that curse of Jehovah, that powerful word of wrath against the wicked, follows, pursues, doggedly, persistently after the wicked, cursing them at every turn. Cursing even their so-called blessings, all the good things they had in life, working the curse of God. And finally, cursing them and killing them in death and pursuing them down into hell itself, where they will experience the curse of God forever. And that must be the case because there is no mercy for the wicked. And that's what David means in our text. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. By which he means only me. Only me and all of God's other sheep. But not the wicked outside of the flock. Not them. He doesn't say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me and the wicked. That would make no sense. That would be absurd. That would be a common, ineffectual, temporary goodness and mercy that follows the wicked all the days of their life, but then ends in hell forever. That would be a kind of a mixture of God's blessings and God's cursings, God's wrath and God's mercy. No, cursing pursues after the wicked all the days of your life, and they will not dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's because goodness and mercy follow after us. God curses the wicked in order to bless us. In addition, that little word translated surely has the meaning of only, only goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The idea being only mercy, only goodness, not cursing, not wrath, not for me. It's not the case that God loves me one day and hates me the next, that God has good will toward me at one time in my life but then bears ill will toward me later on. No, it's always the goodness of God, always the mercy of God, unmixed, undiluted, pursuing me all the days of my life. And that's the problem with the theory of common grace, because they say, that God gives blessing and cursing to the wicked, and therefore, by implication, you have to say that God gives blessing and cursing to God's people as well. If God is blessing the wicked in their prosperity, then God must also be cursing the righteous in their adversity. But that's no comfort to the child of God. That's terrifying to the child of God. 
The second aspect of this assurance that David has in our text is that this rich, abundant goodness and mercy shall follow after him, shall pursue him all the days of his life. And by life he means the present earthly life that we have here down below, which we have to experience in days. All the days of my life. Every day is filled with new experiences. Some of them are pleasant. Some of them are unpleasant. Every day has its own joys and sorrows. But whatever happens in whatever particular day, David is confident of this, that in that day, goodness and mercy shall follow after him. This is not, therefore, a promise of a carefree life of only happiness and never sorrow, only success and never disappointment. No, this is a, this is a life which also includes trials and difficulties. This is not the life promoted by the health and wealth gospel preachers. Remember who's writing this in the providence of God? David. Did David have a life which would be described on the pages of Joel Austin's book, Your Best Life? No. Did he have a life of no cares and no troubles? Of course he didn't have a life like that. We don't know when he wrote the psalm. We know what his life was like from the Bible. There were days when he was being pursued by Saul, who was right to kill him. Then later, his own son, Absalom, was trying to kill him as well. There were days when he was under the severe chastisement of God. Look at Psalm 32. He speaks about his bones being crushed when crying out because of God's terrible anger against him. Look at his own family life. The difficulties in that. Look at his decline in his old age and the sickness that he endured. Was David's life a life free of cares? Of course not. And yet he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, not only on the good days, but all the days of my life. There will be affliction in the life of the child of God. In fact, there will be a lot of affliction in the life of the child of God. But the point is that even in the affliction, goodness and mercy follow. Goodness and mercy follow us when we're in school and we're taking a difficult exam. Goodness and mercy follow us into the boss's office when he tells us that there is no longer a job in the company for us. Goodness and mercy follow us into the doctor's office when he gives us a terrible diagnosis, either of ourselves or of our loved ones. Goodness and mercy follow us into the operating room theater when we have an operation and into the hospital as we recover from the operation. Goodness and mercy are beside us when we are dying and goodness and mercy are with us when we are at the side of a dying loved one and when we go to the grave to bury our loved ones when they die. Goodness and mercy were with the saints of old when they were in dungeons. Goodness and mercy were with the saints when they were let out to be burned alive at the stake. Goodness and mercy followed them as they were thrown to the lions or crucified by Nero, the cruel emperor. It was never the case that goodness and mercy stopped following these saints when they went into all of these terrible experiences in life, but rather goodness and mercy were always following after them. And even in the difficult things of life, God was working out his purpose for their ultimate good. And that's great comfort to us 
There's no comfort in the prosperity gospel because we know that that's just high in the sky. The idea that the believer will have a life of no cares, no sickness, no poverty, everything will just be perfect. We know by experience, our own experience, and the experiences of those who have written the scriptures for us, that such an idea is simply a fable. So this psalm, and this verse in particular, answers some of the mistaken notions that people have about the goodness of God. Some say that God's goodness and mercy are common, are given to everyone. But our verse tells us that goodness and mercy shall follow me, only me, and not the wicked. And only goodness and mercy shall follow me. Some say that God's goodness is delayed. That is, we only experience the goodness of God after we die and go to heaven. Not the case. The goodness of God is both temporal, that is, in this earthly time and eternal forever surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life some say that god's goodness and mercy are not only temporal but temporary that they will not last forever at least not for the wicked because the wicked only have goodness and mercy for their earthly life and then after they die there is no goodness and mercy for them. Not the case. God's goodness and mercy are eternal. No such thing as a temporal goodness and mercy. No such thing as a common, temporary, ineffectual goodness and mercy. Rather, the goodness and mercy which follows the child of God brings him finally into the house of God. That's the end of the verse. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so the psalm brings us to the goal. It traces for us the pathway that the sheep have taken. And it all ends in the house of Jehovah. And that was always Jehovah's purpose. He took to himself a group of helpless sheep. He made them his own. He redeemed them from their sins. He led them faithfully throughout their entire life, providing for all of their needs. And on the way, sometimes we have rich table fellowship with the shepherd. When he lays aside for a moment, lays on a table for us, and we enjoy fellowship with him. Or we turn aside into a uh, king's house, as it were. We become the guests at the table. We're given, we're given a lavish banquet. But then soon, we must be on our way again and continue our journey, whether along paths of righteousness or into terrible valleys, but always with the shepherd who always comforts us, and we are always confident and happy in his care. But the goal is not occasional banquets at the table of the shepherd. The goal is to be in the shepherd's house. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David had a picture of that in his own earthly experience with the tabernacle. That was the house of Jehovah for him. And then there was the temple, a more permanent structure built by Solomon his son. That was the house of Jehovah for many, many years in Jerusalem. And we have Jehovah's house here. It's not an earthly building, but the place where we come to worship him, the church, is Jehovah's house. But Jehovah's house for David and for Solomon and for all God's people and for us too is heaven itself. We know that because of the words forever. 
David did not dwell in the tabernacle forever. And Solomon did not dwell in the temple forever. And we do not dwell in the assembly of the church as we meet on Sundays forever. But we will dwell in heaven forever. That is the house of Jehovah. We are no longer temporary guests having occasional banquets, but sons and daughters, permanent residents of Jehovah's house. And even there, goodness and mercy shall follow us. In heaven, we will know the goodness and mercy of God in a higher and richer way than we ever knew it upon the earth. And that's the goal. Ultimate, final, everlasting happiness in the shepherd's hearts. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy goodness and mercy. We marvel that thou wouldst have such goodness and mercy for us because we are but miserable sinners. But we thank thee that we are assured of this and we pray that thou will continue to lead us and to guide us to our heavenly hope. For Christ's sake. Amen.